freaking episode already! Seriously, it's been how long since we've watched our favorite demons shoot the breeze as well as everything else? I need my fix, man! I need my ice-cold bottle of Boss Equus! Give it to me! I want it now! Okay, for real though, I know it took almost a year for Hell of a Boss to come back, we've all had to wait a long time, it's natural to get a little impatient, but y'all gotta understand what Vivzi and crew have had to go through lately. Not only does it require a metric donkey load of work to get each episode looking all nice and shiny for the masses, but in case you haven't been keeping up, the poor girl's been going through an incredibly rough patch as of late, to the point where she actually had to piece out of the Triple W for a while just to recover. There was some drama involving an ex-employee which put a damper on her mood, and the true season finale for HB had to be delayed due to certain behind-the-scenes problems. They haven't revealed exactly what those problems were yet, but all the evidence seems to point towards... legal issues. Most likely involving the use of a certain song that's become synonymous with Vivzi's older work. And it's not like this finale was going to be anything super revealing or plot relevant, it was basically just going to be a victory lap to celebrate a successful first season. Like a fun little rap party that all the fans were invited to. So yeah, if all this speculation turns out to be true, it would mean that this celebration of an indie creator's success was stopped dead in its tracks by a massive corporation. Irony freaking sucks sometimes, doesn't it? Why must the good die young? But even after all that jazz, or pop, the Spindle Horse crew still managed to brush themselves off and get back to work, taking a sharp turn around their temporary roadblock and going right into the next episode. So yeah, we got to see the Season 2 premiere earlier than expected. And what did I think of it? Well, similar to Vivzi's victory over her hardships, the best way to describe this episode is satisfying. This is a very satisfying episode, for both the viewers watching and the characters within it. Not only does it contain the perfect build-up to some truly triumphant Stolis moments, but the timeline for his relationship with Blitz finally gets the pieces it's been missing meaning I can really go into detail about why Stolitz works as well as it does. Basically, this premiere served up a small but still spicy seasonal appetizer on a well-polished silver platter. You know, along with a two-gallon bottle of absinthe to help you get through the depressing bits. And I can't wait to chow down. As always, if you guys have any thoughts on this episode, feel free to leave a comment below. And if you want to see my other Hell of a Boss videos, of which there are many, I'll have a link to a nice playlist in the description. But for now, let's air out that emotional birdcage and clean up those poo stains as we take a look at Hell of a Boss Season 2, Episode 1, The Circus. Crap. The episode starts off with... My birthday! My birthday! It's my birthday! Well, I said this episode was small for a reason. Yup, Spindlehorse decided to start off a new season of demons that kill, bang, and swear with a cutesy, adorable child flashback featuring Blitz and Stolas' first interactions. Okay, I need to get this out of my system right now or I'm gonna be going insane for the rest of the review. So just give me a minute and we'll get back to the analysis soon. Okay? Okay. Cute! Cute! God, they're cute! You see them? Cute! I love them! Cute! Small little voices, small little faces. Watching them skitter in all new places. Watching them bond underneath the tree. These sweet little babies are killing me! They start off rough and become best friends. I hope this flashback never ends. But it does. Whew. Okay, now that I've lost like 90% of you, let's get back to work. Okay, so aside from the surface level sugary sweetness of the first flashback, which I couldn't get enough of, how's the actual content of it? Well, it's obviously loaded with a lot of reveals, some of which we all saw coming. Like, Butz's father is demon garbage, he's manipulative, scheming, willing to sell his son for pocket change, and... could probably use his horns as a rocking chair when he's pushing 80. Like, jeez, look at those things. How horny can one guy get? <laughs> We see Fizz and Blitzo being best buds who play and perform together on the regular, which was hinted at in Episode 7. Plus, we get to witness firsthand just how differently the two of them are received by the audience, with Fizz being a smash hit and Blitz barely getting a chuckle. Though to be fair, it's not fully unwarranted. Fizz was right, dude. Your jokes could use some work. Heck, I could probably do better. So this legless horse walks into a bar, and the bartender says, How the heck did you walk in here? You don't even have any legs! It was better than his, okay? And of course we see the unfortunate truth that Stolas was not born out of any love or affection, but simply as a necessity to continue his family's bloodline. Something I called a freaking mile away. He is constantly pushed to uphold the family name with a proper demeanor and upper class attitude. And anything less than that, including bowing to others out of respect, or showing the smallest bit of enthusiasm or excitement, is a mistake worthy of punishment. 
It's honestly really heartbreaking to see the pure joy just drain from this Babu's face as his daddy dearest either scolds him for his behavior, continues to push his agenda down his throat, or even just smacks him one out of the blue. Anytime this poor kid wants to have an original thought or do something unique, it's literally beaten out of him. And it really makes you detest his father and anyone else who tries to force this lifestyle onto him. Though I will say, while the dad really is a despicable demon, I'd be lying if I said he wasn't really funny to watch. Paimon, and yes that is his name, is the perfect caricature of the typical, rich, uptight, neglectful, abusive parent. He takes no interest in his son's likes and dislikes, he gives him nothing but the essential tools he needs to fulfill his purpose in the family, he congratulates his own parenting skills after hitting his son, when he starts crying he basically just says, Hey, uh, could you stop doing that? Great, thanks. And even when he offers to take him to the circus, he only accompanies him via magic mirror and insists that they find a spot where he can't smell the poor, even though he's behind a mirror and can't even smell anything anyway. Is there a spot that's close to the front, but also far enough that I don't have to uh, smell the poor? Mirror, mirror in my hand. You freaking suck, dude. I'm so good at daddying. This guy is so cartoonishly bad of a dad that it's just really entertaining. And when you pair the hilarious writing with the vocal stylings of Jonathan Freeman, aka Jafar from Aladdin, you get an absolute riot out of every one of his scenes. You do feel bad for Stolas, like I mentioned before, but the scenes with these two are always presented in a tongue-in-cheek way that never comes off as disturbing or uncomfortable, in the same way regular domestic abuse would. But luckily, Blitz and Stolas don't stay sad for long, as old Cash Buxo sells his son into slavery for five bucks, and the two of them actually start forming a fast friendship. I mean, Blitz starts off as just a pawn in his daddy's scheme, swiping all the riches he can for cash, but the more he pals around with Stolas, the more they start to genuinely bond with each other. They even end off the flashback with this adorable scene under a tree where the two of them just share their future plans for a while. Stolas talks about how his life's purpose was literally handed to him that day, and then he pretty much understands nothing about what he's meant to do other than fill an important slot in his family's legacy. Meanwhile, Blitz has already planned out his entire destiny all by himself, including being a big circus boss with a shiny new office building, and even going so far as to pick out the names of the horses he'll eventually own. Keep this scene in mind, I'm gonna come back to it when I do my big Stolitz analysis in a few minutes. Overall, this flashback was just wonderful. Tons of satisfying reveals, fantastic voice acting from the kids and adults, top-notch comedy, especially from Jafal over here, and all the sugary sweet wholesomeness you'd expect from two kids palling around. Some might find this kind of jarring for a show that's so forwardly filthy all the time, but I thought it was a really nice change of pace that made my eyes and ears smile with joy. But don't you go making no baby spin-offs, Vivzy. I love cuteness, but the industry does not need more of those. Hey there, everybody. Nope, 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 fast forward, fast forward. Whew, okay, so here we are 25 years later. Stolas is stuck in his loveless marriage, and we see that the only two things that bring him solace are his daughter, whom he checks on and smiles, and his antidepressants. Yeah, don't let the colorful bottle fool you, that's obviously what these are meant to be. Heck, based on the label, it seems like they're made by Belphegor, the mythical prince of sloth. Honestly, the idea that the King of Sloth is the one running the drug operations in Hell is so fitting that it hurts. Not as much as Stolas' depression, but definitely a lot. Anyway, the poor guy sulks downstairs, and who's down there waiting for him? But Stella. 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 You know, I remember a time when certain HB creators were actually defending this chick, wondering if she really deserved to be demonized since Stolas was the one cheating on her. Well, in this very episode, we actually find out that Stella is in fact not a bird, she's a dog. You can finish that joke yourself. Yup, we learn in this episode that Stella is not in fact a falsely vilified woman who is rightfully angry at her husband. She's an emotionally, physically, and mentally abusive wife who takes every opportunity to torment Stolas behind his back and to his face. She calls him names, she forces him to be quiet, she physically assaults him on the regular, and she makes insulting remarks to her friends about his performance in bed and the size of his pecker. Unlike Paimon, where it's clear that they were going for a kind of silly, love-to-hate vibe with him, the crew are doing everything they can to make sure you absolutely detest Stella in this episode. And they definitely pulled it off well. 
Heck, I don't even feel sorry that Stolas cheated anymore. That woman talked up a massive game with her buddies, saying that Stolas is a completely pathetic, submissive little twig, a guy that she has wrapped around her talon at all times. He would never do anything that she didn't let him do. But then we get to see him pull off the ultimate act of defiance, his first one in over 17 years of marriage, where he plows a low-class person of poverty that then falls out the window and crashes her tea party, leading to this banger of a lie. That was the sound of a fun king divorce! Bad, bad, bad. The bad's a winner, winner. Obviously, I don't condone cheating in the real world. It's a very dishonest thing to do. But come on, given everything we just saw, that moment is pure 24 karat gold. Speaking of cheating, though, let's take a closer look at that bedroom scene. If you saw the pilot like me, you'll remember a certain flashback moment where we learned that Blitz stole the grimoire after a night of Bow Chicka Bow Wow with Big Bird. And at the time, that's all we were shown. Just a bang for your book that eventually became a business venture for them. But now in this episode, we get to see that scene in a more detailed light, complete with the context that they were once best buds. At first, it seems like Stolas is the only one out of the two that actually remembers their relationship fondly, with him asking all kinds of catching up questions and remembering little details about him. While Blitz just lets him lead all the conversations and comes onto him strongly in an attempt to just grab the book and run. Things seem pretty one-sided initially. But after Blitz uses the power of KING to bind and restrain him, Stoas comments on how happy he feels that the person he gets to make love to is his first ever friend. Also, can we just appreciate how adorably Bryce Pinkham delivers that line? Listen to this. And how much it means that the one who wants me is my first ever friend. Aww. And after Blitz hears this, instead of just making a break for it, he actually stops, turns around, and does the deed. Heck, even after he tells himself that he could just do it real fast, he waits until morning to finally leave. Now, you could say that it just took longer than expected for Stolas to finish and fall asleep, but I like to think that Blitz actually stuck around because he wanted to. This wasn't just a simple transaction, he felt something as well. Something that made him want to stay. Was it comfort? Pleasure? Maybe something deeper? Once again, keep this in mind, we're almost there. So we get one final fast forward to present day, the night of episode 7 after the big Ozzy's blowout. We see that he got completely wasted with his piranha plants, we see him take a whole handful of happy pills instead of just one, and after sifting through a few photos of Blitz on his phone, we transition into Stolas' second solo piece of the show, simply called Stolas Sings. And while it's not sung as well as You Will Be Okay, I gotta admit, it does paint a very unfortunate picture for Stolas' situation. It's not really a song about tragic reality finally setting in, and more about a tragic reality that Stolas has been aware of for ages and now finally accepts. A song of self-awareness about what his life truly is, if you will. Sad, lonely, empty, false. And just as he finishes singing, Stella walks up behind him and tells him to knock it off. But at long last, after dealing with this terrible woman who openly admits that she loves tormenting him, he stands up to her and demands that the two of them finally get that divorce they've been holding off for so long. At first, Stella refuses and even tries to strike him across the face, but with swiftness and aggression, he grabs her hand mid-strike and stops it dead in its tracks, finally fed up with her treatment and demanding at the top of his voice that she take her filthy, fiendish, feathered fanny and get out of his house. Now on the surface, it's pretty insane to imagine something like this coming from someone that was once like this, but when you really look closely at it, it makes so much sense. Stoas' entire worldview and outlook on life was completely changed because of one thing, his relationship with his very first friend. And in the same way that Stoas stopped that hand, I'd like to stop for a second and explain to you all why the fantastic development and portrayal of the Stoas relationship made this moment one of the most impactful in the series. Let's back up a bit. Now we know from Stoas' childhood flashback that everything in his life was laid out for him at a very young age, from the woman he would one day marry to the duties he would carry throughout his life. He was never given any proper love and affection, and he was reprimanded for doing anything individualistic that didn't fit the Goetia mold. He took on his duties as he was told, even if his role in the big picture was one he didn't fully understand. Long story short, his entire childhood life from birth to grimoire has been loveless and linear. But then he met Blitz, a person who embodies the two things that he needed most in his life. 
comfort and freedom. The comfort comes from the fact that Blitz is an imp, which is a species that Stoas has had an affinity for ever since he was a baby. Since he lives in a house where true affection is non-existent, the closest thing to loving companions that he had were his imp butlers, who he treats with a lot of respect and kindness, and this little imp Max plushie that he always had by his side since birth. Honestly, if the Sam and Max franchise is a thing in hell, I guess it can't be all bad down there. Basically, imps were always there for him when his true blood relatives weren't, so it makes sense for him to find comfort in the species that practically raised him. And then of course there's freedom, a trait that Blitz, even since childhood, has fully embodied. If you look back at that tree scene, Little Blitz basically planned out his entire life from his circus dreams to his future horse's names all by himself. Some of his ideas don't really make much sense, and Stolas points this out, but Blitz didn't care. He just had so much passion and drive and ambition, and he got so much joy out of making his own plans and talking about them. I imagine that this was a real eye-opening moment for Stolas. He probably never met anybody like this before. Someone so motivated, so independent, so free. This idea of doing whatever your heart desired seemed to make this little imp so happy, even happier than he was when he first got his book. And I imagine that this little moment, as well as every other moment he spent with Blitz, really left an impression on him. An impression that shows how truly wonderful it is to be free, and an impression that would last throughout the rest of his life. As he grows older, he actually starts to exercise some independence of his own, and begins defying Goetia norms in very subtle ways. Like instead of just treating his daughter like the commodity she's supposed to be, he gives her a very affectionate upbringing, with all the love and attention that Stoas' father never gave him. He even allows her to partake in whatever fashion, music, and hobbies she wants. This isn't seen as anything sacrilegious by Stoas' peers, just very odd and bizarre. But he doesn't care since it makes his daughter happy and also makes him feel very fulfilled. But then comes Stella's not divorced party, where he takes a major step forward, going from things that can be seen as strange by his people to things that are straight up reviled by them. He sleeps with the absolute bottom of the social ladder and fully embraces it. And you can just see the fire in his eyes. This dude is on pure adrenaline right now. This is the most excited and hyped he's probably felt in many years. And it doesn't stop there. He continues to spread his wings in all new ways after that. He becomes more comfortable with being theatric and excitable in public, like during the Harvest Moon Festival. And he has passionate booty calls with his precious little imp on the regular. He still keeps his exploits under some wraps, like probably paying off the imps so they won't talk and making sure to say nothing to the people above him in society, but it's obvious that he's more willing to be himself than ever before. And on top of that, he's got an imp that loves him and enjoys making love to him and being around him and it's truly something that was meant to be. Or... is it? Yeah, as much as Stoas wanted to believe that what they had was special, it's obvious in this episode that he's been aware of the fantasy he's been living in this whole time. When you listen to the lyrics of Stoas Sings, he mentions things like a comfortable lie and playing the fool when I look in your eyes. This isn't him realizing that their relationship was a one-sided farce the whole time, but him finally being self-aware and straight up saying what he already knew but was desperately trying to ignore. This isn't real, and it never will be real. I imagine that he stayed with Blitz this whole time because just being around this imp made him feel complete. He felt more willing to be independent and do the things he's always wanted. He felt that warmth and comfort that he never received from anybody in his family. And while it was obvious to him the whole time that Blitz was just using him for personal gain, he held on to that one foolish but still plausible possibility that maybe one day Blitz might actually feel the same way that he does. That maybe he'll be the one to initiate something and try to take their relationship to the next level. Heck, when Ozzy's comes around and Blitz is the one to call him, he almost has a heart attack. Like, oh my gosh, he's actually initiating. He's actually calling me and asking me on a date. This is too good to be true. But then due to Stolas' own insecurities and Blitz misreading the intentions of his overly lewd behavior towards him, the night ends up being the final straw for their relationship. And in the end, poor Stolas sticks that final straw into the booze of reality and takes a big sip. This relationship was never going to work, and he's finally admitting that to himself. But even amongst all this tragedy, we do see a small inkling of positivity for Stolas. We're shown that the personal traits which Blitz unlocked within him have not only survived, but thrived. 
That triumphant moment where he stops Stella's hand mid-slap, probably knowing exactly where to grab since he's just so used to being beaten all the time, is proof that he has finally reached true independence. He doesn't care what anyone thinks anymore. He's gonna do what he wants and say what he wants, even if it grants him public humiliation. He is not gonna hide his face or try to uphold his reputation anymore. He is done with that, he is done with her, he is done with the snooty family members, he is just done. In the end, even if his relationship with Blitz is pretty much foobar at this point, the positive effects that Blitz had on his life helped him to reach the apex of his character arc. If you put all of Stolas' appearances in chronological order, you can see that he goes through tiers of growth going from having no freedom at all, to exercising freedom within his household, to exercising freedom within his rung on the social ladder, to just being completely free. And it's all thanks to Blitz. It is true that Blitz did use him, and I'm not trying to say that their relationship was a healthy one, but moments like this show that there were some positive things that came out of it. Things that molded Stolas into the person he is today. But Stolas was not the only one that we learned more about. Get on over here, Blitz. It's your turn next. Now, I've talked about Blitz to death on this channel saying how I believe that his self-worth and general views on love have been permanently tainted due to many past experiences. And while we don't exactly get to see any of those experiences play out in this episode, there are definitely moments that shed a new light on certain things. Remember that bedroom scene? The one where Blitz not only decided to sleep with Stolas, but even spend the afternoon and night there before finally leaving? Did he actually enjoy his time with Stolas and wanted to stay longer? Well, let's look at the facts. This is the point in Blitz's life where a lot of his relationships likely went sour. If he's just starting up his business, that means he already had his falling out with Fizz, he already broke up with Verasica, and God knows what horrible things went down with his family. These are some of the core events that birthed his everybody's gonna leave me so what's the point and I just make everybody worse mentalities. But then he comes across Stolas, someone he was friends with 25 years ago. And even after all that time apart, he still remembers Blitz's name, including the now dropped O, he remembers his previous career as a clown, he remembers how he made an entrance during his circus acts, he remembers almost everything. And you know what? In spite of Blitz's one-track mind in getting the book, I like to think that resonated with him somewhat. Remember, he's got the habit of never bothering to form long-lasting relationships because everyone ends up leaving him at some point, and on terrible terms, too. And yet here's a guy who's been away from him for two and a half decades, and yet he still remembers him fondly, even happily calling him his first friend. In a weird way, this is the rare instance of one of Blitz's loved ones who always remembered him even if they were far apart, and someone who he actually had a positive impact on. And I imagine that kind of gave Blitz a fleeting moment of comfort that he never felt before. I can see now why Stolas was the pure angelic figure in Blitz's Truth Seekers fantasy. At first I thought that Stolas was just a glimmer of hope that maybe Blitz can have a positive relationship one day, but considering what we just saw, Stolas also kind of stands as the first instance of living proof that people do care about Blitz, despite his constant doubts in himself. Stolas is the first time in a long time when Blitz got evidence that someone cares enough about him to remember even small little details, and that same person is better off because they got to know him. Of course we haven't seen his full backstory yet, so that statement could be dated eventually, kinda like some of my videos. But yeah, Stolas being the first example in a long time of Blitz actually having someone who cares about him, and thus Blitz forming this unspoken attraction towards him because of it, makes total sense to me. I'm honestly not entirely sure where Stolitz is going to be going at this point. We do see Stolas open up to a book page talking about Osmodius crystals, which according to Twitter translators are stones used by succubi and incubi in order to travel to the human realm. So, maybe Stolas is gonna track down one of these and give it to Blitz as a sort of farewell gift? Like giving him a method to go to the human realm so he doesn't have to screw him for the book anymore? Basically saying, Here, I know you need this for your business. You can now go to the human realm and back as you wish, and you'll never have to hear from me ever again. Honestly, I'd be really interested to see what cutting the book agreement out of the equation would do for these two relationship-wise. But again, we don't know for sure what's gonna happen, so we'll have to see. Well, what else can I say except... The circus, the circus, I love the circus! This episode may not be as insane as some of the previous ones, but it does its assigned job and does it fantastically. Not only is this episode enjoyable on its own with some precious Babu backstory shenanigans and moments of pure hell yeah triumph, but it manages to shed more light on the show's most prominent relationship while also setting up some excellent future promise for the two characters involved. Even though it's been almost a year, this episode got me right back into the hell of a boss spirit, and I cannot wait for the pure insanity that's sure to unfold during Season 2. But where would I rank this one among my overall favorites? Well, here's the thing. 
While this episode did a great job at filling some holes in Stolitz and making me squeeze with joy at the babies, I don't think it's quite on the same level as Truth Seekers or Ozzy's. Ozzy's was a pure emotional spectacle with colors, music, and feels that engulfed your senses, while Truth Seekers is the textbook definition of the perfect Hell of a Boss episode, and you can watch my reviews if you want to know exactly why. This one did really well, but it's not quite on their level in my opinion. Does it at least beat out Lululand though? Yeah, believe it or not, I'm gonna say no. I honestly don't know why, maybe it's because of the sentimental value I feel towards it, maybe it's because the song is a lot better, maybe it's because this episode has both little baby cuteness and Moxie throwing up into a trash can, but for whatever reason, I can't really bring myself to rank the circus above the theme park, it just wouldn't feel right to me. Alrighty, I guess that settles it then. The circus is officially my new number 4 favorite episode. Not quite top 3 material, but still hella cute and hella entertaining. But as always, I'd love to hear what you guys think. What did you think of the season 2 premiere? And are you excited for where Stolitz and the season as a whole are heading? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.